The agenda this week learned why the stock market can be booming while the economy isn't and took stock of childcare in the province. The agenda's week in review begins looking at how Ontario's film and television industry is faring in this COVID-19 era. You have to have production insurance to make a show. And anyone who was in production or who was close mm. to production had an insurance policy that would cover them even in the case of a COVID outbreak. But any new productions who didn't already have COVID insurance, insurance companies are now imposing COVID exclusions on them. That's basically the equivalent of having car insurance that doesn't cover you for a car accident. So for the majority of shows, insurance isn't a nice to have, it's a must have because of the way we make the shows. So I'll give you an example. If you, do not, if you have a COVID exclusion and you try to go to camera and your star goes down, let's say we're talking about a big scripted drama, and your star goes down, and that star goes down for a couple weeks, you're shutting production down for weeks. And there's hundreds of thousands of dollars associated with that shutdown that can't be reimbursed. And on top of that, we've got hundreds of thousands of dollars in COVID costs for all the new people that had to be hired, all the new protocols that had to be implemented, all the equipment that had to be purchased. All of this stuff is just dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. And it all adds up. And if those two things are not dealt with, a lot of productions will not be coming back. I do want to follow up on this, but let me just, um, let's take a moment here just to give our viewers a sense about the kind of money that we're talking about, because this is mm -hmm. one of the most significant economic drivers in the province of Ontario. Sheldon, maybe you mm -hmm. could bring these numbers up. This is for 2019. It was a record-breaking year for film and television production in the province of Ontario. North of $2 billion spent on productions, 343 productions basically one for almost every day of the year, that counts to 44,540 direct and spin-off jobs. It was a 15% increase in production from 2018, and it meant 7,500 new jobs for Ontarians. We know that 2020 uh, is not going to look anything like that. Cynthia, do we yet have, or I guess do you have, any sense about uh, how much smaller the numbers are going to be when you look uh, on December 31st back at 2020? Well, they're not going to look like that, that's for sure. We know that between March and June, we lost seven, over $700 million in spending, so that money won't be spent this year. Um, we aren't as fast getting up to speed like we were. You said, you mentioned, you know, we had 343 productions last year, almost one for every day of the year. Um, right now, we have 50 Teen shows in that are shooting, so a big difference. At this time last year, we would have had 50 shows this week shooting, so uh, a more than 50% decrease. It does kind of depend on if we can find an insurance solution and how fast some of those productions can get back to work. Um, we are hoping to see a lot of people back to work by October, November, um, but it will be a greater than 50%. Okay, Alistair, I should give you a chance now to come back on some of the points that Marla made, namely the issue of yeah. can you really get back into production if you can't get COVID insurance for your biggest stars, et cetera, et cetera? There, there, look, there are definitely going to be a couple of shows that we, that we don't see return in 2020. But what we have also now picked up is a bunch of producers who have never produced for film, television, or digital media before. And those folks are the theater producers and they are charging ahead. So while we are only seeing 15 to 20 big productions shooting on the streets right now, for my members, for the Actor Toronto membership, they're actually now working uh, at, a, you know, at a good level. We are still way off of 2019, way, way off. But we've, in, we've now suddenly invited all of these new producers to the table as well, who are now streaming theater into the digital, into the digital world which engages the services of performers, which is you know, my membership, which is good for everyone. Hmm. Cynthia, does Film Ontario have any advice or recommendations uh, for production companies in terms of dealing with this insurance issue? I would never give an individual producer some advice, <laughs> but I mean, each production has to do a risk assessment on their own particular production. So productions range in size, as I was just saying, from very small, um, they may be comfortable taking on that risk if they only have a three or four day shoot and aren't risking a two week shutdown. Uh, for the series that don't have coverage, I, Marla laid it out perfectly, uh, is they can't absorb that type of financial hit. Yeah. 
And in addition, their uh, investors aren't going to believe that they can finish their show without the insurance in place. So they're not even going to have access to the money to absorb the hit if it happens. So the advice is to help us out in making the argument to government that some sort of insurance solution needs to happen and to keep looking at solutions. As Marla also said, we're a very creative industry and we do come up with creative solutions. Francis, is the stock market supposed to be an indication of the health of the economy in general? Well, no, and sometimes it gets, play it gets played that way because the better the economy is doing, the better companies will do. I have two roles. I'm both an economist and a strategist, and the reason I'm employed by people who manage money is to give you a GDP forecast. How will the economy do? Why? Because over the long run, that's our best guess of how companies' earnings will do over that period. So there is a relationship between them, but what we have to remember is that really the companies within our markets are not the same division as they are over our economy as a whole. So typically you're not going to find people saying, well, the economy is doing well, I'm going to invest in the TSX. You're going to hear people more saying, I like Canada's energy sector, therefore I will buy energy stocks. Now that's not to say that there's nowhere to invest in Canada if you want to make a play on the economy. Usually our Canadian bond market and the Canadian dollar have a much closer relationship than the stock market. There is a link, but it's really not as simple as saying the stock market is the economy. That's just not factually what's happening here. No, for sure. And, and Brian, maybe you could follow up in this regard. You know, the, the, one could understand the public being confused about that because on the one hand, they see the markets doing reasonably well. And on the other hand, we just experienced the, the biggest shrinking of the Canadian economy on record since StatsCan started keeping records almost 60 years ago. Why is there such a large disconnect at this particular juncture? Well, because the, the drivers in the market, especially in the U.S. market right now, are, are the big tech giants, and there are five or six of them, and, and they're dominating uh, market conditions, uh, and people are betting heavily on them, I, I would say too heavily, on the fact that they're innovative, They've done very well even during the pandemic and that their prospects in the future uh, still look terrific because they, they basically have monopoly power in their sector. Uh, that is not the economy. Uh, if you look, in fact, even at the S&P 500, which is supposed to be a fairly broad index, uh, the five biggest companies in that index are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, uh, those are the, you know, and Facebook, those are the giant companies. They account, those five companies account for about a fifth of, of the entire S&P earnings. So, so it's not balanced. And that doesn't tell you very much about how the, how the economy as a whole is doing. You know, how we know that retail is struggling, energy stocks are in trouble. Uh, we know that uh, the bulk of the economy is not doing nearly as well as these five tech giants. In which case, Francis, why don't the people who run these exchanges feel more of an obligation to include companies that are more representative of what the, the broader economy is actually doing? Well, they may have the push towards doing that, especially because this representation has changed so dramatically. But let's also remember that the companies listed in, let's say, the S&P 500, they're really biased toward manufacturing sides of the economy, industrial and tech, whereas the things that affect your and my life on the day-to-day, -day, things like services and jobs are not represented there. So I'm not sure that we need to say we need to change the system. What we need to do is recognize that when someone says buy a diversified portfolio, buy the S&P 500, sure, it's more diversified than buying one stock, but a fifth of what you own is big tech. So what we have to do first is really disabuse ourselves of the notion that when you buy an index, you're buying the broad economy. You certainly are not. Like I said, if you want to make a big bet on what you think the economy is going to do, zero in on why you think that's going to happen. Now, I will say on the flip side that if you had told me before, back in January, we're going to have a really bad pandemic and everyone's going to have to stay home and do their interviews with the agenda over their phone using high-end internet, they're going to have to work from home, buy their groceries online, what would I have invested in? I would have bought tech stock. It makes perfect sense. In the United States, I would have bought healthcare stocks, which are 15% of that index. Are we really saying that, sure, there's probably a divide between what these companies should be and what they shouldn't? 
But effectively, it makes a lot of sense to, I think, most people that tech companies and those that are affiliated with a pandemic and work from home are doing really well. And those like airlines and casinos are doing really poorly. When you put it in terms like that, does it really seem so disconnected? No, that makes perfect sense the way you've just described it. But then, um, OK, well, Brian, why don't you help us by uh, following up and track sort of the development of the tech stocks on the markets, how they have changed the composition of the exchanges over the last, let's say, three decades. What have you seen? Well, it's really, it's much more recent than that. I mean, we, we saw the tech boom in, in the 90s, uh, which collapsed. But in, in the 90s, uh, the S&P uh, was a much broader index. It had different sorts of companies in it. And these tech giants uh, did, hadn't reached the level they have today. And, you know, we're talking now, two of them are trillion-dollar companies. That wasn't the case 30 years ago. Uh, but over the last decade, they've increasingly become more and more dominant. And once they entered the, the Dow Jones index, they began skewing that index as well in the same way. But if you leave them out, then you're leaving out the key drivers of, of the current market. Child care largely pays for itself as an investment. And one of the things that's really interesting coming out of the, the sort of Quebec experiment, if we want to call it that, is that one of the significant results of it has been a significant increase in women's labor market participation and, and a concomitant decrease in levels of child and household poverty. So as, as an illustration, um, in between 1997 and 2016, the labor force participation rate of mothers in Quebec of children aged zero to five increased by 16 percentage points from 64 to 80 percent. And elsewhere in Canada, the increase was just four points from 67 to 71 percent. So we see that those kinds of public policy investments have significant impacts both on labor market participation, but also on the downstream effects. They're on taxation uh, levels increase. So governments get more money, including, hilariously, the federal government actually has done quite well out of the taxation revenue generated by women's labor market participation in Quebec. But we also see really important child development outcomes. So it's a system that, for every dollar invested, yields more than double in returns. Elizabeth, let's do another comparison, and this time not to a province like Quebec, which is not dissimilar from Ontario uh, in terms of size and makeup and so on. Let's do Northwest Territories. That's pretty different from Ontario. What did you find there when you looked at the NWT? You know, looking there, it's, it's a different place in Ontario and Quebec. Um, the same story is that it's a really good investment to, to put money, government money, into childcare. Specifically in the Northwest Territories, when we looked at it, it was actually a better deal for the government to invest in childcare than mining, diamond mining, one of their huge industries that people are very concerned about spend a lot of time, political um, thought about. But actually, if they're going to put a dollar into childcare, it's going to be a better deal than a, a dollar into their mining industry. It's a pretty big deal. We, uh, you know, we do talk about this subject quite frequently on this program, as recently as just a few days ago, when Armin Yalnesian, who is, uh, of course, a well-known economist and uh, Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers, uh, she and I talked about this. And uh, let's play a little snippet of that conversation, and then we'll come back and chat, OK? Sheldon, if you would. Child care is the choke point on recovery. And child care is treated as a market delivered system. It too is functioning with loss of user fees and higher costs and more of them will shudder and we're just standing by uh, watching this social, vital social infrastructure collapse because of market forces. So there's some sectors that we actually need to immediately address and prevent further loss in Carolyn, can I start by getting you to follow up on that, why addressing child care is so essential to a post-pandemic recovery? What's the argument? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as always, our, our meme just hit the nail on the head. Um, it, it is essential both to economic recovery and social recovery. And it's important that we tackle it quickly because, as our meme pointed out, um, the child care sector right now is very unstable. And we know that here in Ontario, just over half of Ontario's child care centres have reopened at this point. And what we worry about is that some of those that are still closed may never reopen, right? And it's primarily because, you know, right now, they're temporarily have low enrollment. Now, we know the usual story in child care is that there are 
lots of wait lists, that it's hard to get a space, that they're oversubscribed. And right now we have the opposite situation, a very low enrollment, which means child care centers deficits are closed down, which means that they may close down permanently. But again, we know that's a temporary situation. Um, if we look at, say, um, emergency room usage, there was a great study from back in the SARS pandemic that showed that it took two years for emergency room visits to go back to normal post-pandemic, right? But we never thought, oh, well, I guess we could just let that emergency room close because we know that we would need it, right? But childcare, because it's left to the market, because it's, you know, each individual, sometimes a volunteer parent board trying to figure out how to keep the doors open. We're just going to stand by and, and watch the whole sector collapse unless, you know, the province and the federal government wake up and make a strong investment into childcare, understanding that it's essential to our economic recovery and also essential to social recovery. Young children who have been uh, experiencing this pandemic, you know, have had their daily routines upended. Um, they need a strong quality childcare system that can help them look to a brighter future. So I see it as an investment, not only in the economy, but also in our, our social fabric. That's just some of what we've covered this week on the agenda. For more, including those conversations in full, you can visit our website, tvo.org, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.